This is the video for B4.2 on ecological niches, and we'll take a deeper dive into adaptations for niches. One of the more visible adaptations that organisms tend to have um, are the things that relate to their diet. And so we're gonna look at the relationship between dentition and diet. Now, dentition relates to your teeth, like a dentist, and we're going to specifically look at omnivorous and herbivorous representatives of hominidae. So hominidae is the family that includes like humans, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, things like that bit of primates. And what we want to kind of see is the pattern between what do their teeth look like and what do they eat. So herbivorous animals or herbivorous <laughs> organisms in this family um, are plant eaters and they tend to have large flat teeth good for grinding. So if you can imagine the teeth that are all the way in the back of your mouth, they're big and they're flat and they're great for grinding things like seeds and grains. Omnivorous animals, animals that eat both plants and other animals, have those teeth, but in addition to those, they have these sharp canine incisors. You have those also, and those are great for both like catching prey and like tearing at meat. And so understanding what uh, type of teeth an organism has tells us a lot about its diet. And this is especially important when we're studying extinct species. So if you've ever wondered how scientists know what different dinosaurs ate or what Neanderthals ate, we're mostly looking at their teeth. It's not just gorillas and orangutans that have to eat, it's also bugs and insects. And so we'll take a look at um, different types of herbivorous insects. And there's basically two general mouth uh, adaptations, right? Depending on what they are eating. So you could have jaw-like mouth parts, um, like this beetle here, and this jaw, so I'm extend seeing it extended here and here, is really great for like biting and chewing. Then we have mouth parts like we're gonna see on this aphid. And this aphid has a tube mouth part that extends down into the phloem. And so these are going to be mostly organisms that are like sucking the sap out of things, right? So again, they eat different things. So we would expect them to have differently shaped mouth parts. Just as herbivores have adaptations for eating plants, plants have adaptations to resist being eaten by the herbivores. Some of those adaptations include having spines or spikes, having stinging parts, or being able to produce toxins. And so whether or not that toxin is poisonous or whether it just stings, like this stinging nettle plant, um, there are many different varieties of um, deterrent methods that plants have evolved um, to utilize. Now, in this back and forth, some herbivores have adaptations uh, to even overcome some of these adaptations from the plants. So for example, some species of aphids produce saliva that acts as a barrier so that when they stick their mouth part into the phloem, um, plant toxins don't come in contact with their actual mouth part um, and don't hurt them. Um, but it's a great example here of this evolutionary back and forth for resisting herbivory, making herbivory successful, and so on and so forth. What about these organisms that eat other things? Well, predators often have very special adaptations for being able to catch prey. Some of them are going to have chemical adaptations, so their bodies produce certain chemicals that help them, like if you think about venomous snakes like the cobra, for example. Some of them have physical adaptations like lions and bears. They have big teeth and big claws. And then others have behavioral adaptations. So for example, this moray eel is very good at the ambush. It will hide underneath of a rock and then it will ambush its prey. All of these are different adaptations for catching uh, their food. But of course, the prey have special adaptations to avoid being the food, okay? So some of them have chemical adaptations, like the monarch butterfly produces a toxin um, that would kill a predator, so that's a great way to avoid being eaten. Some have physical adaptations, like this walking stick bug right here um, is great at camouflage. It looks just like a stick, 
and others have behavioral adaptations. So small fish like these snapper can school together and look like a larger fish. That's a great example of a behavior to avoid getting eaten. Now, some of these adaptations evolve faster than others. So things like behavioral adaptations can happen very quickly, like in the course of uh, a couple of generations. So for example, bears 2000 years ago didn't know that they should be, you know, toppling over trash cans and eating everybody's leftovers. But now that humans and bears are interacting more often, bears are exploiting that opportunity. They've behaviorally adapted. OK, um, they are much faster than things like chemical adaptations. So chemical adaptations tend to be the slowest um, and then physical adaptations somewhere in between. So developing a toxin took a long time. It's not like this butterfly could just write a letter and ask to have toxin. Remember, these are all caused by mutations and mutations are random and they happen in individuals. So the time it takes to accumulate the mutations that are successful for an entire species is a very long time compared to behavioral modifications that can happen, um, be learned and then passed down through parenting. Now to take a look at some of the cool adaptations for plants, we should really go to where there's a lot of competition for plants. So plants that live in the desert, they're not really in competition with each other as much as they are, um, you know, struggling to survive in a challenging abiotic environment. In places like the rainforest, the challenge isn't necessarily the abiotic components, it's the competition for other species. So what we're going to find is a lot of the adaptations that they have are to help them overcome that competition. So for example, trees might grow very tall so that they don't have to worry about their light being blocked out by other trees. Um, some vines can grow through other trees and then use them as support. So why waste energy growing a trunk if I can just use your trunk? Um, some air plants like the epiphytes can grow on tree trunks where there's more light. So again, if I'm an epiphyte, why would I grow down here where there's not a lot of light? I would rather grow up here where there's a greater chance of me capturing enough light for photosynthesis. Then there are, are even some parasitic plants like the strangler figs. Some people call them strangler epiphytes and they can climb up the tree and they eventually even outcompete their host and they end up killing their host. Um, and then we finally have shade tolerant shrubs. They grow on the forest floor where the levels of light are low. However, they've evolved special adaptations to help them um, still survive even with that low level of light intensity. So let's go back to this idea of niches. We said that an ecological niche is the role that an organism plays in its environment and it has a lot to do with its range of tolerance, how it gathers food, and how it interacts with other species. So we have two different ways of thinking about these niches. We have what's called the fundamental niche. And so if I think about all of the different abiotic factors um, that kind of determine how an organism can survive in its ecosystem, we get this fundamental niche. Okay, now the, the hard part about that is, is that especially here on the peripheries at the edge of the range of tolerance, so if this circle represents the range of tolerance, right over here on these edges, oh, it's barely making it. It can barely hold on for survival. And it's likely to be outcompeted in those areas. So in that way, it's no longer gonna be able to really utilize this stuff there. Competition is going to move in and it's going to eliminate that organism from that part of the environment. Again, competition from other organisms that are more well suited for that range of tolerance are going to kind of eat away at an organism's role in its environment, okay? So the fundamental niche is kind of like a very optimistic uh, outlook. 
Here are all the places that an organism could live. A realized niche is more realistic, okay? And so this realized niche is the fundamental niche minus all of the things where that organism gets outcompeted by other species, okay? And so the realized niche will be smaller than the fundamental niche. So let's say I have two species. Each of them has a fundamental niche, right? So I have one species. Here's all the um, different niches it can occupy. And here is another. Well, in cases where their niches overlap, one of these species is going to be better adapted for that environment at that time, and it will be able to outcompete the other. So let's say the species that I have here in blue is actually able to outcompete this green one in the spots where they overlap. Well, then my niches start to look like this that this species here can really occupy its entire fundamental niche, whereas this species over here has a smaller realized niche because even though it could occupy this part of the niche, it's getting outcompeted by the other species. And this leads to exclusion in parts of the range of tolerance. So for example, this green species here could live in this part, it's within its range of tolerance, it's just getting outcompeted. Now, if a species gets outcompeted in all parts of its fundamental niche, it's going to be excluded from the entire ecosystem. And this has happened a lot with climate change in particular. So let's say I have um, this bird that lives um, at the top of the mountain, okay? And it's very good at living in this one spot and it likes living up here that there's very little competition up here because it's cold, the altitude is crazy, all these things that other birds that live down here, oh boy, my bird drawing skills are about to be bad, that's a bird. <laughs> other birds that live down on this part of the mountain um, can't l tolerate the conditions up here. As climate change starts to become more and more pronounced, the range of this species might start to increase. And in areas where they overlap, if this species is able to outcompete this species, this species will have nowhere else to live. It's been excluded from its entire range of tolerance. And so this isn't just happening with birds on top of mountains, it's happening with Arctic foxes and all kinds of things. Okay, so we need to understand how changing the range of tolerance by introducing different abiotic factors to ecosystems can possibly affect organisms whose niches aren't overlapping yet, but will be soon.